Okay. Well, as I said, I, I'm really grateful to be back here in Sydney. And I basically, somebody uh, said, if you're always so happy and you feel everything is just so perfect, uh, why do you leave your house or why go anywhere? Uh, if there's nothing to fix in the world, there's no, nothing to improve, nothing to make better, if you have a state of uh, peace and contentment. And I said, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I, I really could just watch the grass grow, or I have a, a three-legged cat who was born with only three legs, and, and all we have to do is get the ball of yarn out, and uh, we could play for hours, you know, in the sunshine. Uh, and it's very, very simple and joyful, but when the phone rings, or when I get an email or something, and somebody invites me, uh, to come together. I, I can never resist an invitation to, to join together. And so that's really what my life uh, has turned into. It's just been a lot of heart-to-heart -heart conversations uh, with a lot of dear friends all over the world. And, um, and it really did not start out that way. I was, I think some of you know that Moses uh, stuttered and that Gandhi was very shy. And I was also very shy like Gandhi. I, I didn't have many friends in high school and not too much in college, and I was voted most quiet in my senior class. And so then I end up going around the world and talking about love and God, uh, which they always warned me never talk about politics or religion in public. Uh, so it's, it has turned into a very different lifestyle than I ever imagined. Uh, I you know, grew up in the United States and really had no intention of traveling to any country. I used to think, oh my gosh, you'd have to get one of those thingamajiggies, those little paper things, and, and border control, and stamping, and luggage, and uh, searches, and all kinds of things. This was back before 9-11. Uh, when I was a kid, I was thinking <laughs> these things. Nowadays, it's like even more searches, and paper, and lines, and so forth. But actually, now, I, I actually enjoy it. I, I don't mind getting searched two or three times. I just see how... Everybody's doing the best that they can, and they're, they're doing what they're doing because uh, they feel it, it is important. And even the ones, the security guards are, are searching you because they believe it's for your safety. So I have, a, a, what people would say, a lot of patience and tolerance because I just really relax and live in the present moment. And so, you know, if a line's 200 feet long, it's 200 feet long. If the traffic is you know, three blocks and jammed up, I'm having a good time. Uh, if the plane gets canceled, I just have a party and enjoy uh, whoever is with me. Um, I, I really don't have a bad day. I, I haven't had a bad day for uh, many, many years, and I, I think that's part of the reason why people invite me places, <laughs> is because uh, they like to hang out with somebody who's never had a bad day for, for years, just out of curiosity. Uh, like my cat sometimes is like curious, but I think my cat's pretty close to the same uh, state of mind. Uh, she could really care less about the world. She just stays in purring in a state of like continuous joy as well. So she's a good companion that way. And so basically what I'll do is we talk about forgiveness really, um, I think when you boil it down to what goes on in this life that, that most of us move along in our life and we grow and we begin to open up and we become more wise and it's beautiful how we can grow spiritually and I would say at the core of it whether you call it forgiveness or something else basically we're letting go of judgments and grievances and I think the whole teachings of Jesus you don't really need the whole New Testament just two words judge not uh, would cover the whole teachings you know if we could just simply be in a state of acceptance and allowance uh, what a great life. Uh, that, that requires a lot of trust because we need to be very intuitive and start to realize, oh my gosh, if I'm really trusting and very intuitive, then I'm just in giving mode. I'm not looking to receive anything, I'm not looking to receive attention or money or resources, possessions, you know, I'm just in giving mode. Uh, there's no problem in giving mode. It's when you get into expectations and get mode, which is what human relationships are all about, whether it's with the government or your spouse or children or your neighbors or whatever, uh, politicians. You know, when you have expectations, uh, you're, 
you're setting yourself up for a bad day. And the more you cling to those expectations, the day doesn't get any better. Uh, it's almost like you've, you've stubbornly made a decision that in order to have a happy day, I have to get the kind of day that I want. They should call me back. They said they were going to call back. Uh, it's their job to call me back. And you know, you can wait for hours or days and uh, lose your peace if you're not in giving mode. And the most amazing thing I've found is that when you're in this mode of just purely giving and extending, uh, the whole world just rolls up at your feet. Um, I just started years ago just feeling this intense love and intense joy and wanting to just share it and extend it in every conceivable possible way I could find. Give it away for free, just dispense it, you know, everywhere, on the street, in, on the internet, uh, through phones or telephones, teleconferencing, anything. Uh, and amazingly, everything just started to flow to me and through me so that everything was taken care of. And suddenly, what seemed like a very serious life of struggle and difficulty and problems, every day facing a whole new set of problems, just vanished. Uh, it took a lot of mind training and a lot of inner work, spiritual work. I can't say that uh, I didn't go through many tears and lots of really dark emotions and dark nights of the soul and all the stuff that you hear about. I had to go through all of that. But at some point, it was like uh, I didn't have any more questions. Uh, I've been curious and questioning. I was into 10 years of university, so I studied philosophy and psychology and science and, and, and was like the Renaissance man, studied everything under the sun and became really well versed in, in everything of this world. But I still had questions. Uh, I still saw God and love as the great mystery, you know, like they talk about in the Native American terminology, you know, the great mystery. Now there's not even a great mystery for me. I mean, it's like even something that people might call God or love, it just feels like a state of mind that I experience uh, continuously. And so there's nothing mysterious about it. Uh, you know, it's not like I, I'm in a state. I, I think with in terms of love, I am in a state of awe, just unspeakable awe about that love. But it also feels like it's very natural, like it's the most natural experience you could ever have. Like it, it seems silly to think that there could be any other experience other than the love. That seems really funny. And so I don't really need to, to read uh, the funny papers or hear a lot of jokes. I mean, I can just look at the headlines uh, on Yahoo or on newspapers and I just burst into laughter uh, sometimes I just will laugh for five minutes just at a, at a headline. Uh, I mean, one time I was actually uh, looked at the internet and it had uh, study, colon, uh, marriage does not lead to happiness. And I thought, where did they come up with these uh, headlines, you know, study, marriage does not lead to happiness. But I was just curious, so I, I was laughing, but I, I looked at it, and sure enough, they they studied lots of people, they used a huge sample, and they found that they studied all the single people and how happy they were in their life, and then they studied married people and how happy they were in their life, and they noticed that when people got married, there was a little blip, it went up <laughs> just a little bit, and then right after the, the little blip, the honeymoon period, it went right back, and so the people that were unhappy before they got married were unhappy after they got married, and the people that were happy before they got married were happy after they got married, and that the event of marriage, you know, taking the vows and saying I do, didn't change the state of mind of the person. You know, people were just about as happy uh, as they expected to be, regardless of the, the event of marriage. So I just howled laughing through the whole thing, and I thought, you know, okay, what? this is just showing that basically, you know, what Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States one time said, you know, a man is as happy as he makes his mind up to be. Uh, you know, real common sense kind of teaching. And we all kind of can relate to that. You know, that if we want to get in a fit and have a bad day, oh, we can have a bad day. And we can make it last as long as we want to. Until we're sick and tired of having a bad day and we go, Oh, that's silly. <laughs> and then we sometimes just start laughing where before we were crying or whatever. 
And you start to realize that, that your state of mind is not dependent on the world. I mean, I, I've gone to funerals and had wonderful times, just glorious celebrations at a funeral. In fact, my grandmother lived to be 99 years old, and she used to tell me for years, I've, I've listened decade after decade, she would say, I don't believe in death. I just can't believe that I can die. Uh, and she would say things to me like, uh, she would see visions when she was younger. She saw visions of her mother when her mother died, smiling at her, as if to say, there's nothing here, there's nothing to be afraid of. And uh, she would say, I don't believe in hell, uh, even though she was raised Christian. She said, I can't believe God would ever send anyone to hell. And I would say, yeah, me either. I, <laughs> I, we would just have these quick talks, you know, like, oh yeah, yeah, I gotcha. So that when she seemed, so the body seemed to die, uh, when she was 99, then I simply went to her funeral and uh, I just kind of tuned into her in my mind and I said to her, what do you want me to do uh, here at your funeral? And she said, well, let me talk at my funeral. She wanted to speak at her own funeral. Not the kind of DVD video, you know, where they, they film you and then they show it there. She, she would never go for that. Live. Lillian live. She had to be live. And so they had a minister up there who gave the eulogy and the, the family members were all crying and they, you know, oh, David, wiping their faces. Can you, can you get up and talk? I thought, okay, I'll get up there, but uh, you better be ready. And, and so I got up there to speak after the minister had already spoke, and then Lillian, for like the next 15, 20 minutes, just spoke. And people were really crying then. You so could, could feel her presence. I mean, they all loved her, and they were crying at the beginning of the funeral because they missed her, and then they were crying during the talk from Lillian because they loved her so much, and it was just apparent that she hadn't gone anywhere that she was still there. It was like she was there lifting people out of their grief. And then we went over to the cemetery and there were all these flowers that people had brought. And she just again came through me and just said, come on, take the flowers with you. Don't leave them here uh, on a gravestone. You know, take them. They're beautiful flowers, you know. And, so, and the people were all kind of stiff and everything. So I, she got through me and it, it was like uh, one of these movies where they get a hold of the body. And there I was going and handing out flowers to everybody, come on! And then people were crying and saying, wow, she's, she's here. It's like she's, she's not gone anywhere, you know. It's, she didn't die. <laughs> she really, she pulled it off, you know. And so that, that's the kind of thing that happens to me. That's a funeral, to me, was a very joyful experience. There was no grief. It was lighthearted. It was joyful. It was happy. And it's the same for me with anything else. Um, I actually went to a, a, a bedside scene where there was a man dying one time, and uh, the, uh, some friends took me there, and uh, he was laying on this couch going through the final stages of dying, and um, all of a sudden the spirit started speaking through me. It's like, I just am willing to show up and be helpful if I don't plan to say anything. Uh, I didn't plan to, this was a family I didn't even know, and I happened to be there, and the spirit started speaking through me, and uh, the sister of the dying man, she said, no, wait a minute, this is, I'm very uncomfortable. She was Catholic, and she said, I'm uncomfortable with the words that are coming here and everything. And then the dying man raised his arm with that last bit of strength he had and said, no, let, let him continue. I want to hear what this man has to say. Turns out he was a Course in Miracles student, <laughs> and, which I didn't even know. Uh, and he had struggled with the book because he had worked with it, you know, to really try to grasp the message and live it. And he had difficulties with certain aspects. So it didn't matter that he was on the final hours of living in this world. He had questions. And he wanted to lay there on the couch and listen to what the Holy Spirit was speaking. So the, the sister just sat down like, okay, <laughs> go on. But, uh, I find that these experiences that I have, uh, it, it has involved a lot of mind training, but basically I, I didn't want to hide or protect anything that was in my, my unconscious mind. I just wanted to be fully conscious so that everything that was happening, I could understand that I was deciding for it. It wasn't like the world was doing anything to me. It was more that I was just making decisions based on my unconscious belief system. And, and it wasn't pretty. 
uh, letting the unconscious beliefs come up. It, it felt dysfunctional at times. I felt like, how can I, how can anybody function uh, when you're uh, covering the ego? You know, this thing that's been running the show for a millennium, and you finally let it up, and it's dark. It's, it's very dark, and and you feel almost dysfunctional at times. But then I, I thought, what else is there to use my time for? Uh, I don't really want to try to achieve something in the world. I want to find inner peace, and I want to live in a state of, of joy. So then I started uh, traveling around the United States and Canada for about 11 years. I had no job, I had no money, I had no church support or organizational support. Uh, that was very striking for me. I mean, after you know, you go to school and your parents teach you, you know, how to how to work at a job and you learn skills and you learn how to earn money and and cash in your paycheck and save money and spend money. You know, we we go through that stuff, and yet um, the Holy Spirit told me, he said, no, no, that you know anybody can do that, uh, and pretty much everybody on this planet goes through some form of that. But to learn how to be 100% intuitive and just trust and listen and follow, the Holy Spirit says that's going to take some mind training. You know, you're going to really have to train your mind because you're listening to this other voice, the ego, and all this knowledge and book learning that you've done and everything that you've, you've accumulated is not going to get you uh, to the kingdom of heaven. It's not going to make you happy. It's just going to be part of a delay maneuver. Not that the Spirit was against anything that I learned. I mean, all those skills and abilities and knowledge that I learned in those 10 years of university and all the way through graduate school, that was all just given over to a new purpose. To heal and to bless. That was the only purpose that all that learning had. For nothing else. Not to achieve anything, accumulate anything, possess anything. Not to build up pride. Not to make a better self-concept. You know, not to... Uh, be bigger, better, faster, more. You know, the spirit wasn't interested in any of that. But uh, it has helped me relate to people in all walks of life. So when I travel around, I could talk to farmers and engineers, nuclear physicists, quantum physicists. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter. And mother, father, aunts and uncles. You know, I've, I've gone through the same family life, uh, the same thing, uh, have a child, uh, go through the same experiences that people go through on earth and there's a lots of uh, fears and worries and concerns about am I doing the right thing have I done enough could I do it better you know how good is good enough you know yeah went through all that stuff as well and then once I cleared my mind and became tuned into the Holy Spirit I just let the Holy Spirit speak through me and smile through me and hug through me and I've just met thousands and thousands of people that are really sincere about finding inner peace. And that that's the one thing that draws us all together, is this desire for inner peace. And so, it depends on who I'm talking to. I mean, if I'm talking to a group of psychologists, and I have talked to psychologists and therapists, the Holy Spirit will speak in, in psychological terms, contemporary psychological terms not just like Freudian or something, but more contemporary terms. It's kind of like Eckhart Tolle will, will speak in more contemporary spiritual uh, and psychological terms about consciousness, for example, but not speak so much about religion. Um, and yet when I'm with a group of Christians or uh, Buddhists or Hindus or whatever the language, it will come out in their terminology. I know enough from reading the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the Buddhism, the Quran, and so forth, that, that I can speak their language. Some of you even know that like Eckhart, uh, Eckhart Tolle and different uh, spiritual teachers, like Advaita Vedanta teachers, will say that the mind is the problem. You've got to get out of your mind. And then if you study A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, oh no, you are a mind. Uh, you're a mind and you're holy mind. <laughs> You're, you're purely mind, you're nothing but mind. So I have to let the Holy Spirit translate the semantics. I speak to one group, and they say, get out of your mind. And then you speak to the other group, get back in your mind. Uh, you know, you, you have to really be flexible with the things, you know. One group, uh, you speak to the Buddhists, there is no God. There is no deity. You speak to 
talk about the void and emptying the mind, the contents of consciousness, and just experiencing the present moment. And the Buddhists come, ah, oh, yes, namaste, very good, very good. You go over here, you talk about God. Here, oh, God, the Lord, the Lord, you know, you go, the whole thing over here. And you get into quantum physics, and you talk about, you know, you know, connectivity, you talk about entanglement, which is kind of a neat scientific word for oneness. Uh, the scientists call it entanglement. <laughs> that sounds more like codependency. Uh, but, but actually, when you're talking to a quantum physicist, you must use the words like entanglement, you know, uh, superposition. Everything is potential. Everything is energy and everything's potential. And only by making the decision, you know, by being the observer in consciousness, do you shrink down all of the potential down to a specific. Australia, South Africa, Holland, China, Japan, these are the specifics. But, but these really are, they seem like real countries. Australia, South Africa, Holland, China, Japan, India, New Zealand. Um, but they're just thoughts too. And it seems like when you fly away, let's see, so you flew away from Australia, and you went to Europe, in your mind you think that Australia is really back there. Like, like when you fly back, it'll be there waiting for you. But actually, it's just concepts in your mind. If you open to a state of mind, you start to realize these are just concepts. Uh, there are great thinkers like Krishnamurti that used to talk about nationalism. As almost a, it's like a plague. <laughs> Why do you think countries fight each other? Uh, I know it's your mind that believes in the countries. Like when I first traveled, I went to Argentina, and I go down to Buenos Aires, and I've never been out of the United States and Canada, and I landed in Buenos Aires. And I'm down there, and it's 2003, and I'm doing all these healing gatherings. I'm doing 19 consecutive Course in Miracles gatherings on 19 consecutive days in Buenos Aires. And in the middle of the gatherings, an event happens in the world. The United States starts dropping bombs on Baghdad. And anti-American protests break out. They're burning, burning effigies of George Bush in the streets. There's what, riots going on and this and that. And I'm still taking my cab rides to go to do my gatherings. I did say to them, I said, what's, what's that banner say? They had a banner across the road. It was all in Espanol, which I didn't know. I'm down there. I have all these translators, 14 translators following me around because I don't speak Spanish, but the spirit covers it. I said, what does that banner say? It said, Senior Bush, take up knitting. Uh, I said, that's, that's wonderful, that's darling. As they're burning an uh, effigy of, of Bush, they've got a beautiful banner, take up knitting. That's very constructive. I think that would be an excellent form of meditation. Uh, much more benevolent than, than loving. So then when I went there, though, Every other gathering, they're always asking about the mind and consciousness and, and death and, and relationships and all these questions. The first question comes to me translated from Spanish was, you know, what is your view of your president? Uh, it's suddenly, just because of one event, a bunch of bombs dropping, suddenly it turned very political. But to me, nothing's, it's all consciousness. It's not really uh, about countries or anything. So I, I said, I, said uh, I have no president. And it went back and translated back, don't you understand the question? Uh, and I said, I translated, I said, no, I don't understand that question. Uh, I don't have a president. Uh, I said, you know, we're all, we're all children from the same source. Uh, we're just here to extend the love of our creator or our, of our source. And, and I said, we can't buy into these things of countries and all these false concepts uh, and think, that they have real leaders and, and there's real political systems and there's real societies that are outside of our mind, is that that would drive you crazy. Uh, get all defensive and be proud about which country and who's right and who's wrong. And then uh, the Holy Spirit just immediately started singing John Lennon's Imagine through me, you know, Imagine there's no country, I wonder if you can, nothing to kill or die for. The Brotherhood of Man. And they started all singing with me down there in English. And I just had chills going up and down my spine as we're all harmonizing on that song Imagine. And 
I was like, wow, that Holy Spirit ended that one in a hurry. In fact, that was the last political question of the whole trip. Uh, they kept coming back every day, and they, then we got back to the perennials, relationships, death, and sickness, you know, and, and, and we kind of worked our way inward, but there was no more political questions, because the Holy Spirit just zipped through that real quick. So I think that's the most important thing to remember, is, is that you have a very high calling, and no matter what you think about, it, it is just thoughts and concepts that are part of your consciousness. And the more that you empty them out and realize that you were mistaken about them, then the better. And also, for me, I, it really helped to, to study science and quantum physics and so forth, because I could see that in these disciplines, that they were speaking this, about the same things that the, the mystics and saints had been talking about for centuries, that finally our science was catching up to our spirituality, and they were coming side by side and talking about the very same thing. In fact, um, I've been working with the Course, I don't really read it anymore, and I don't work with it on a daily basis anymore, but actually, I started working with it in 1986, and after several years, I was reading the Course and Quantum Physics, and I read uh, a quote from an Australian quantum physicist named Paul Davies in his book, where he said in his book, there is no world. <laughs> he was just talking about how it's all energy. And just because some of the energy vibrates at a more dense rate, and we call it perception and human beings and whatever, that it's a trick. That really everything is entangled or connected, and it's only when we have slower vibrations that we believe that the separation seems real we have a subject and we have an object, and, and there's an interaction between the subject and object. But he was basically saying this is all just uh, make-believe, you know, it, he was getting into waves and particles and saying that uh, basically the observer is, as soon as the observer watches something, then it seems to concretize it and make it into a solid perception. But if you get back far enough in, inward into consciousness, you see that it's all it's all energy, and it's all one energy. It's, there's not, not even degrees of energy. And it doesn't die. It doesn't go away. You can't kill energy. It just stays on. So I was reading that, and then he said, there is no world. Then I was reading A Course in Miracles, and I was on Lesson 132, and it said, there is no world. And I said, oh, here we go. The, the scientists and the mysticism, it's all saying the same thing. And isn't it great that we can now open our minds up in this day and age and see that it's all saying the same thing. That, that nobody's right and nobody's wrong. Uh, that, that it was just a misperception that we had separation. So, it, in daily living though, this it, it's very practical. It does get to be more like a fairy tale when you flow through the day very happily and you start to think of somebody and they call you. You start to think, well, it would be nice if da da da, and then da da da. Uh, you know, <coughs> things just start, it's like instant manifestation. That uh, you think it, you perceive it. Uh, John Lennon did a song, Instant Karma. Instant Karma is going to get you, it's going to knock you off your feet. <laughs> uh, and he wrote this song basically saying that, that karma is the belief in giving receiving, but once you kind of bring time back to the present moment and the Alpha and the Omega come back together, you start to realize that everything that you want to experience, you can experience instantaneously. That time and delay are not necessary, they're not essential. But you can collapse time, that's what a miracle does, it just brings everything back to the present moment. And we all can relate to that, because in the present moment we don't have any problems. It's just when we start to remember the past or anticipate the future that the regrets and the guilt and then the worry and concern comes in. But when we learn to just kick back and relax and just let each day be given to us moment by moment, the art of living moment by moment, it's really a glorious life. I mean, it's just one glorious happy moment after the next. That's what uh, we've been here, uh, Helen and I have been staying with Les and Tina, and we've just been laughing and laughing and laughing. It's been laugh therapy over and over and over. Uh, 
and we don't. Uh, sometimes when Helen and I go upstairs, then Helena just gets into the laughs and the giggles, and then it's like in the top floor, it just cascades down. And then when we come down to have lunch or dinner, it's like we heard you laughing up there, and it's contagious. Uh, yes, it is. It's, if you ever are with somebody, I call I call Helena the laughing saint because she can just get laughing sometimes for no reason. I mean, it wouldn't do you any good to say, what are you laughing about? Uh, because then she just laughs harder. Uh, because she doesn't really have a reason to give you, and then if you persist with it, she will just continue laughing and laughing and laughing. Uh, and it's, it is uh, contagious. Uh, to me, uh, this world came about by taking separation seriously. And this world is healed in your own mind when you learn to laugh and not take anything seriously. When you actually start to have states of mind where illness disappears, disease disappears. Uh, when you have such a state of trust, I mean, some of you, I see Russell was up at Noosa, and that's, uh, Les and Tina were up there, and we've, uh, Roger, you know, we've had some great gatherings. We, 57 people joined me last year up there in Noosa. Imagine eight days and seven nights. I mean, it's hard to get off for vacation uh, and figure out to get eight days of art. I had 57 people with me up there at this at Noosa. And we were at this resort where there was like four swimming pools and uh, it was just very relaxing. And we watched metaphysical movies. We laughed. Person was doing intradanza, people were all sprawled out on the floor. It looked like a big love fest, love fest from the 60s, the hippie generation. Uh, people, I mean, I even had one of the clips on YouTube where we just, one of the days, we just got into laughing uh, because of, after this day of silence, I think you remember, it was the people told their stories and it just started erupting into laughter. And then it was like doing the wave of waves of laughter started uncontrollable, like the forest fires uh, down near Melbourne, you know, that just the winds catch them. These waves of laughter would start and, and it would just erupt. And then we would be crying and crying and hoping that our diaphragms and our tears would, would just, we'd get a break, you know, and then the next thing would come up and then more waves of erupting laughter. So we, I put, I think on YouTube, one of these sessions where I probably am laughing, wiping the tears away uh, for like five minutes in a row, trying to uh, stop, your cheeks just start to, you just, you just, it's your face starts to contort after you just, you can't stop laughing. And, and that's really healing, you know. You can have a, a judgmental thought when you're in the middle of hilarious laughing. laughing. You just, you can't hold a grievance when you're laughing. You know, it was just spectacular. The other thing, Les was sharing this parable and I have shared this parable all over the world because, because Les uh, desperately wanted to come and spend time with us up there and he was able to get off of work at, with Qantas uh, to come up there with his wife Tina and spend eight days. And it was quite miraculous actually. And then uh, I was coming down this time and uh, Les desperately wanted to be here when Helen and I were here and spend time, maybe go to Noosa, go to Tilba, this and this. But to get, uh, uh, he wasn't really going to try to force it, he was just going to but just listen to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit said, I will arrange it for you. But I'll arrange as much time as you need. But that's quite a job for the Holy Spirit to arrange 24 days off. Uh, I don't know if you have jobs and careers, but do you imagine going into your boss and, and saying, uh, I want 24 days off, but Les wasn't even going to do that. Les was going to wait until he was given 24 days off that would synchronize with my time being here. So not only would not ask for it directly, but would just wait till it was given to synchronize perfectly with this visit to Sydney and then later in the month with Noosa. And it happened. Uh, seemingly because of the global economic crisis and because of the more pilots that are needed and, and 40, business going down 40%. So all it took was a global economic crisis <laughs> for us to get these 24 days. And, and it seems funny, but the deeper you go into metaphysics 
and you realize that the whole world is your mind and that there's nothing more important than forgiving and waking up. And even if you read A Course in Miracles, Jesus has got some astounding things to say in there. He says, if you're a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space for you. We never heard this growing up. You know, be a good little boy, finish your plate, and Jesus will arrange time and space for you. <laughs> you don't have to go to school. Uh, you don't, don't have to get good grades. You don't have to worry about working jobs and careers. No, Jesus will arrange time and space for you. You'll be a, a good little miracle worker. Uh, is there anybody here that heard that <laughs> growing up? <laughs> I, I was raised in a, in a Protestant family. Yeah, went to church all the time, but nobody was telling us that we would grow up to be miracle workers. Nobody said that time and space would be arranged for us. <laughs>